Okay, welcome everyone to the second day of the Bootstat meeting. Uh, so we're going to start uh, the day with the with the continuation of Alessandro's uh, lectures on the the Kahoma Bootstrap. So uh, take it away, Alessandro. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, okay, so um, as you as you see, we are a little bit behind schedule uh, on what what I planned. So I, I will have to skip a few details about the discussion today, but I'll be happy to expand uh, several things that I will mention in passing during the, the discussion session and, and the question uh, and the question time after the lectures. Just a little bit, um, I was it was pointed out that I had a, a typo in one of the references. A uh, couple of numbers were switched, so this is the correct reference for the title lectures. Um, the eight and the nine were, switch, were switched in the previous one. Okay, so we, uh, in, in the previous lecture, we introduced the conformal group. Uh, we studied the representation of, of, the, of the conformal algebra. And then we saw that uh, once we start studying uh, correlation functions, uh, these are very constrained um, by, by conformal symmetry. In particular, two-point functions are completely fixed uh, up to a normalization that can be resolved in the, the definition of the operators. And then at that point, three-point functions are uh, fixed up to a few constants, which we call OP coefficients or three-point function coefficients. And then uh, one, uh, once we go, we start going to higher point, higher point function, we saw that uh, co covariance under conformal transformation only uh, per se is not enough to fix the general form of, of this of this uh, um, correlation function, so we had to do something more, and the something more was to uh, to exploit the existence of a space uh, Hilbert state of space uh, Hilbert space of states, and from that we can draw a lot of conclusions. So I will just jump directly to uh, the main point. So we, we are in the framework of radial quantization, as we said. So we are, um, so we are quantizing our space in concentric spheres of increasing radius. And then um, this picture we saw uh, can be mapped to a very um, convenient picture, which is the cylinder interpretation of the theory. And so we, we concluded that a conformal field theory in arbitrary dimension, a Euclidean conformal field theory in D dimension, behaves very, very closely to uh, a, a, an Euclidean quantum field theory uh, on a cylinder, which is R times uh, a sphere of dimension D minus one. And from this uh, parallelism, from this analogy, we can import a lot of familiar concepts that I will now uh, remind you. In particular, we, uh, we established that uh, on, each con on each sphere in, in our CFT, we have a uh, Hilbert space of states. And uh, basically, we can associate to each state an operator that creates this state when acts on the vacuum. Uh, in the path integral, this operator uh, is just an insertion of the operator in the path integral, uh, for, insta for instance, in the origin. So we have this state operator correspondence. So for any operator, and I will only talk about primary operators, so for the bottom of each irreducible representation that are labeled, as we saw, by the scaling dimension, and the representation of the, uh, S, uh, the rotation group, SOD. So uh, each uh, such operator, when inserted in zero, um, creates a state, a primary state on the sphere, so on any sphere surrounding it, um, and center in zero in particular. So this creates a state delta R. And it's a primary state, it has the same quantum number. Then if you try to move this object around, uh, you don't put it in zero, you just put it at some value X, it will still create a state on surrounding sphere, but then this state will not just a primary, it will be a superposition of primaries and descendants. But in any case, it creates 
um, uh, a state in the same irreducible represent. And this, this duality between state, well, this correspondence between state and operators is very powerful and allows us to uh, conclude a lot of things, uh, so to infer a lot of things. In particular, uh, the first object that we will need is the so called operator product function. Or OPE. Um, and the idea is the following. Okay, this this um, what I'm going to say can be formalized in many many ways. It can be made very precise. So we'll just flesh the the, the, the important points, and then if you want, you, you can ask me uh, more about this later. So the idea is, uh, if we take an operator O1 uh, and we and you put it in zero. Then of course this operator, as we said, creates a, a, um, a state with dimension delta one, a representation R one. Then if you take a second operator and, and you put it in X alone without the operator O one, this also creates a state, of course, uh, with dimension delta two, representation R two, and eventually the descendant, because we we place it in, not in zero. Now, what happens if you put this, if you insert both of these operators inside a sphere? Okay, you have a sphere. Oops. Okay. And then you place inside the sphere both operators. So there would be O1 here and O2 somewhere uh, here. And then, of course, on the, on the sphere, you still have your either space, so you still create a state. But this state will not be, of course, in a, in a reducible representation because uh, you inserted uh, more than one operator. Nevertheless, this, oper this state can be expanded in a complete basis of the Hilbert state or the space of states. And we know that each, uh, in particular, the Hilbert state can be decomposed into a reducible representation of the conformal algebra. Therefore, this state psi will be uh, decomposed on a complete basis. And this complete basis can be chosen to be uh, a basis of this form. So there will be a sum over delta and R, uh, all possible deltas and R present in your Hilbert space. And then there will be a primary state with dimension delta representation R plus descendant. So I can group um, uh, all, this, all the state in the same representation and can group them together in, in inside the parentheses. Of course, there will be co relative coefficient that we know nothing about so far. And then of course, there will be some uh, a coefficient in front of everything, uh, which we can call lambda delta L. And depends of course on the representation and depends also on the, sorry, let's, let's make it more precise, depends also on the external operator and the quantum numbers of the representation exchange. But then, okay, so this is, uh, is well, this is clear. Uh, it's, um, it's the composition exists because of um, standard theorem of quantum mechanics and it, it's convergent and uh, has all very nice properties. But then we can go, go back and use this uh, correspondence of states uh, and operators that we, that we um, just uh, mentioned Therefore, the state, the state psi is, has been created by taking two operators, uh, O2 in X and O1 in zero, and uh, place inside a sphere. Okay, So with this symbol uh, times in the between, I really mean that we have to take this operator, place them inside a sphere, and consider this object inside a correlation function. But nevertheless, we have this. Uh, uh, Correspondence between state and, and operator. And uh, the right hand side of this sum, in the right hand side of this sum, I can replace each state again with its represent with it with its associated operator, which I will call O delta M and L. And it will be placed in zero for uh, since um, well, this is the correspondence we are using. And uh, the descent, how can I represent the descent? The descendant can be represented as uh, a primary on which we act with uh, 
the raising operator in mu. So the descendant will just be uh, in mu to some power acting on the same operator. Okay. And there will be, of course, an infinite sum of them. And then in front of everything, we still have uh, this uh, coefficient. Of course, this is very imprecise because there are indices to, to take into account. There is X dependence to be taken into account. So let me give a more formal statement of this, uh, uh, of this expansion. So normally we write it like this. And okay, let me also switch the order of, of one and of two just for uh, sake of uh, convention. So if I, if I play it, if I take an operator O1 with dimension delta one representation R1, and I uh, place inside a sphere together with an operator O2 placed in zero this time. This object will be, uh, can be written again in the spirit of what we have been saying. So uh, you take the state as, uh, produced by this object on the sphere, you decompose it, and then you replace each state in the sum by an operator. Uh, you, can, you can write this object as a sum over all possible uh, representation that are, are present in your theory. Um, there will be uh, an operator O with dimension delta and, and representation, sorry, R. Uh, here, before I call it L, but let's call it R to be more, to be more general um, in zero. And then I can efficiently uh, repackage all the descendant into a function. Uh, a function of the of the generator p mu, which in on coordinate space is just uh, has just a, a, deri um, a differential representation um, as a derivative. So this object is usually called c, which depends on o one, o two, and o three, uh, and sorry, o delta l, delta r, and it's a function, as I was saying, of uh, coordinates x and is a function of p mu which uh, has a differential representation as a derivative operator and generically there are also uh, indices to be contract to contract the indices of the operator o okay so this is a, a, a compact way to rephrase what we have been saying namely that uh, in, uh, in this expansion we repackage together the contribution of each irreducible representation. And this derivative here, once you tailor expand this function in terms of the derivative, you get all the contribution of the same. Now, so far, this, is a, this looks like a, a very um, um, abstract way of, of phrasing things. But the nice thing is that you can actually fix uh, this uh, this function by uh, imposing consistency consistency with uh, conformal invariance. Uh, in particular, for instance, um, uh, conformal invariance, conformal symmetry. Six, six is for uh, the form of this function C O one O two O delta R I. Uh, and the reason is very simple because if you think about um, if you if you start from a three point function, let's say O one of X one, O two of X two, and then we place the operator O I delta R in X three. We saw yesterday that this is fixed by conformal symmetry up to uh, certain coefficient lambda O1, O2, O delta L. On the other hand, I can start, I can now use the operator product expansion inside this, uh, inside this, correlation, this correlation function. I can draw a sphere surrounding X1 and X2 and not X3. This will create a state on, on this sphere. And then I can expand this state on a, on a basis. Okay, so this is what we are doing. We are using the OPE uh, 
for sphere surrounding these two points. And then uh, you see in this, uh, you will get a sum over all possible delta and L, this function C of all uh, delta, um, let's call it delta prime R prime. But then uh, we also saw that two point functions are diagonal. So in this sum, only one term is basically selected. So the sum, the infinite sum be, become just one term. Um, which is nothing else as the uh, C J, I mean index, or one or two, same operator or delta L, two point function of this operator, which is also fixed. Uh, so I keep switching R and L because I'm used to. Uh, so this is in X2 now, and then we have the, the original operator OI delta R in X3. So the original three-point function was fixed by conformal symmetry. The final two-point function is fixed by conformal symmetry. This allows us to fix this function C, also fixed. Of course, the fact that it's fixed, it doesn't mean that it's easy to express. But nevertheless, uh, in principle, can be uh, can be computed. For instance, by expanding both uh, terms on uh, for x one x one two much smaller than any other distance, okay, you can express this function c as a Taylor series in uh, in x one two and derivative with respect to two to to x two. And in fact, I I invite the, the younger students to uh, in the audience. To try this exercise. Okay, you start from a three-point functional scalars. You use the OP, and then uh, and then, for instance, you can you can compute the, the function C in case of scalars, and it's very well, you can do it iteratively, uh, order by order. So, in principle, uh, from now on, I will just assume that this function is is uh, is fixed and computed. Notice that this OP is something that people familiar with. To the uh, two-dimensional CFT uh, are, are, are very uh, confident with, um, in particular in two dimension, uh, people you uh, use uh, the OP, but you um, but the OP in, in two dimension is used in different ways, uh, and it's rarely used in this form. In particular, normally we use a uh, form of the OP. The following uh, structure, for instance, a very a very widely used OPE is the OPE of a field of a primary field uh, with um, the stress tensor, okay, and this has a universal behavior that people usually quote. For instance, the first term is given by the scaling dimension with a simple pole p minus omega times. Uh, phi over omega plus the second term is the, the derivative of phi, uh, z minus omega. This is the standard plus uh, normally uh, square. Plus, usually people uh, simply neglect the square should the, be the, the, the first terms term. and say, uh, okay, regular term. The square should be on the first. This, term. Is, for, this is for a primary. Uh, another interesting OP that people use that usually uh, works out is. Uh, is the OPE of two stress tensor, okay, which has a, a term which is which is given by the central charge. Okay, and then there are uh, the same the same term as before. Now the, the scaling dimension is two, and then there is um, again the derivative term. Maybe you should put that square in the first equation in the right place. Uh, yes, you're right. Of course, it's in the in the in the other in the other world. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was writing in the decreasing powers of the, of course. Thank you. Plus regular. Um. And then, okay, uh, these are this is really very similar to the OP that we have, we have been writing. 
except that this, this, these terms that are, uh, these are fixed by, in a sense, by word identities or by two point function in the case of the central chart. And then all the regular term are neglected. But in fact, this uh, regular term contains the specifics of uh, a given conformance field theory. So in, in our, in higher dimensions, uh, we will be interested in all these terms, we will not neglect them. Um, and uh, it will be important to keep them, okay? Because they contain, well, also in two dimensions, but um, in, in, in they contain the, the details and, and they, they're able to differentiate between different, different fields. Another form of OPEs that are widely used are those for, for instance, uh, the famous fusion rules of minimal models uh, or verbal modules, okay? Uh, that are normally used, uh, uh, written as um, something like this. Um, sum over K and um, L in some interval that I'm not going to write. I can I can write if somebody is interested, but okay. This this k the, the values where k and l are uh, range are fixed, and then you have uh, another reducible Verma module with index k and l. But I should stress that these are this is not an OP. Okay, uh, this this is a fusion rule, which is basically a, sta uh, a statement about. Um, composition of uh, irreducible representation. Uh, it tells us what can enter in, uh, in the product of two representation, but it doesn't tell us anything about the strength of with which each representation enter, mean, mean basically the coefficient in front of uh, each of each operator. Okay, it's, uh, it's like uh, when you merge, uh, when you take the tensor product of two spins uh, under rotation, then you know which spin enter, uh, but um, you don't know the Klebsch chord. Okay? This is the same, this is equivalent. Uh, but still it's important and uh, we'll make use of similar expression also in our. Um, but it has to be, you should keep in mind that this is not an OP, okay? It doesn't, it, this is not a, a relation that holds uh, even, in, not even in correlation function. It's not a, a, an identity among operators. Um, okay, so in our case, instead, we will, as I said, uh, write uh, we will focus, for instance, um, on uh, uh, scalar operators, for instance. In that case, uh, the OPE scalar looks like something like like a, like the following okay you have a scalar operator over in x a second scalar operator um, in um, sorry in x, x1 and x2 genetically you can place them both uh, at distinct points it's just a matter of translating the expression that we had before and um, as i was saying there will be a sum over a certain operator k with dimension delta k and representation r k, there will be um, as a, there will there will be this this uh, function c that is fixed by conformal symmetry, and because it's fixed by conformal symmetry, you can easily show that it's proportional uh, to the triple function coefficient of two scalars and the third operator, which I will call for one for two. Okay, there will be, you can also show that there will be an overall factor, <clears throat> which is nothing else than X12, um, the modulus of the difference uh, to the power delta one plus delta two minus delta K. And then uh, there will be, um, if okay is a, if the operator okay is a scalar, it will just be okay evaluated in X2 plus the standard. 
If the operator OK is not a scalar, then there would be also a tensor structure to contract the indices. Okay. This is a simple case of this. If it's not a scalar, uh, then as I said, there will be a <coughs> core um, x12 mu, x12 to some power uh, to construct the indices. And I would like to make some comments, um, a few comments about this, uh, this expression that will be useful later. Um, in particular, the OPE is subject to a certain set of se selection rules. Which means that uh, in the OPE of so two given operators, it cannot appear whatever you want. Um, in particular, only certain SOD representation can enter. Okay, this, is, this you can understand because you're merging two representational of rotation, you cannot obtain whatever you want. Of course, uh, representation do not. Um, um, uh, do not fuse uh, in the usual way because you can generate indices, you can contract indices using X. So you can also, you can always add uh, trace symmetric indices. But nevertheless, uh, there, is, there are some selection rules that apply. So for instance, in particular, in the case that will be, that will be most important for us, uh, in the OPE of two scalar, There will only be um, spinel rep uh, representation with L integer. So, ten so tensors with L indices, traceless and symmetric. Um, if the scalars are identical, then there is also a permutation symmetry that applies, and this selects only um, even Ls. Okay. So um, you have to keep this in mind when, when you study OPEs. And, and also, also, if there is a global symmetry, let's call it G, under which uh, the operator O1 and O2 transform, then uh, this, uh, and this global symmetry commutes with the space-time symmetries. Uh, then the OPE can only contain representation um, OPE can only sorry, can only contain representation R prime uh, that are contained in the tensor product R1 times R2. Okay, in this case it's, it's very simple. So for instance, in the ON model, you have fields that are charged under this ON symmetry, and the OP reflects this, uh, this symmetry uh, through selection rules. And a, third, um, a final uh, comment <clears throat> about the OP, uh, which we should keep in mind, is that it's valid inside correlation function, as we said, and it's valid as long as you can draw a sphere surrounding these two points that do not contain any other point. So this also gives us uh, information about the convergence of this, the radius of convergence of the OP. It holds, uh, the radius of convergence is given by the closer, the closest point to uh, these two X1 and X2. All right, so now that we have introduced our final ingredient, we can um, go on and um, apply uh, this new this, this new tool uh, to make progresses in um, uh, in the study of correlation function. So let's go back to uh, the correlation function of uh, four scalars that we said is not fixed by conformal symmetry, and let's see if we can express it using the OP uh, as a, a sum of correlation function with smaller number of uh, fields, which uh, of course is the case. Um, so let's go back to four point function. Of scalars. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, and I will take them identical. Just for simplicity, but of course you can apply the same logic to non-identical scalars. So uh, the, the programming function will look like uh, phi of x1, phi of x2, phi of x3, phi of x4. And generically, the strategy in two dimension to study this correlation function is to, uh, well, if the theory that you want to study, for instance, contain a reducible Verma module, um, then um, this you can show that the correlation function of this of containing this, this uh, reducible Verma module has to satisfy certain differential equations. And then you can hope that uh, by solving a differential equation, you can you can reconstruct you can find the, for, the, the form of the correlation function. Um, this, um, unfortunately, this approach does not work in, in a high dimension because we don't have, uh, well, but there is a, an analog of uh, short multiplets that we will see later, uh, but this, uh, this condition is not strong enough to, um, to create, uh, to allow for a complete solution. So we have to cook up something thick. So in particular, um, let's see how we can proceed. So as I said, we want to use the OPE to express this object in um, as a sum of uh, known quantities. So we can uh, we can take uh, the OPE of the operator, of the operator phi of x one phi of x two, and together with the pair phi of x three phi of x four. So uh, I have to apply the OPE in pairs, but so this will result in a double sum. In, in a double in two, in two sums over the two OPEs, okay, phi, phi, and phi, phi. Um, so this is a, a certain sum, this is another sum, but we know that two point function resulting um, by this OPE are diagonal. So in the end, there will be just one sum. So we'll write it as a sum over operator OK uh, that are contained in the OPE phi with phi. Notice that um, generically it would be the intersection of the two OPEs, but in this case um, the OPE are the same, so there is no such inter such constraint. And <clears throat> uh, we said before that uh, this function C um, that we uh, that we we able to fix with conformal symmetry are proportional to the uh, uh, three point function coefficient lambda phi phi okay and we get two of them so there's a square then there is a prefactor uh, <clears throat> that takes care of the scaling properties which is x12 to the power 2 delta phi minus delta k eventually and x34 to the 2 delta phi minus delta k again and then there are these functions uh, the remaining functions uh, that take take Takes care of that. Take care of uh, resumming the descendants. So let me call them um, C uh, Tweedle. And the, the, this, the difference between C and C Tweedle is that I stripped out lambda and x. So this is a function of x12 and derivative with respect to uh, 2. It has some index i and depends on phi, phi, and OK, of course. And there is a similar one, C Tweedle with index J, uh, depends on operator phi, phi, and OK, and is a function of the, of the, of the vector x34 and derivative with respect to 4. And these, uh, these are differential operators and are applied to the two point function of OK with index i placed in x2 and okay with the index j placed in x4. This is the complete form of the OP. And now we can compare this with the expectation that we obtained uh, the last lecture uh, for the four point function. So the four point function of four identical scalars, we saw last time that by conformal symmetry, it has to be a function of a generic function of conformal invariance divided by uh, a prefactor that takes care of the covariance properties. So um, it was 
the x12 to the power 2 delta pi, x34 to the power 2 delta pi. Uh, <clears throat> by comparing these two uh, expressions, uh, we, we argue that the function GUB is not arbitrary at all, but in fact can be expressed as um, in principle calculable, calculable quantity. So, in, first of all, uh, it admits an expansion, a decomposition uh, on a sum of a representation, uh, reducible representation appearing in the OPE phi with phi is proportional. Each term is proportional to the operator, uh, to the three point function coefficient lambda square. And uh, each of these uh, three point function square multiply a function that also has to be a function of conformal invariant only. And it depends, of course, on the quantum number of the operator OK that is exchanged. So it will depend on delta k, the dimension of OK, the representation RK of the operator OK, which we, we, we saw is actually uh, an integer in L. Um, so L is, an int is parameterized by just an index, a, a, a positive number, sorry, a positive integer number. And in principle, it could depend on uh, the external dimension, but in this very simple case, uh, it doesn't depend on delta phi. Um, and it also has to be a function of the conformal invariant. And the reason why each of this term um, is a function of the conformal invariant is because uh, if you make a conformal transformation, each uh, irreducible representation transforms among it itself, itself. And therefore, since the function GUB is invariant, and you have a sum of things that uh, transform among themselves only, uh, they also have to be invariant. So they, they also have to be function of uh, the conformal invariant U and D that we defined yesterday, uh, which are these, uh, let me remind you, you were x12 square, x34 square divided by x13 square, x24 square, and v was similar. Uh, it's basically u exchanging two with four. This will be used for later. Uh, yeah. So computing, so as I said, this, um, this, this, this object here, they sum up the contribution of an irreducible representation to the four point function. And in principle, they are computable. And for this, they, they deserve a name and they're called conformal blocks. So, in, as I said, in principle, they are computable because the, the function C, P, those are computable. The two point functions are known. So, in, generically, you, you could hope to uh, be able to perform this, uh, this sum over, um, to, to, co to compute the, the ex um, explicit form of these, uh, these uh, functions. Um, on the other hand, computing this, uh, this conformal block uh, is a, a very challenging task. And uh, in the 84, uh, Zamologico found a recursion relation that allows to compute via Zora conformal blocks in a recursive way, okay, uh, using the analytic structure of the via Zora block as a function of the central charge thought as um, a complex variable. So in the complex plane of central charge, uh, if you think this, co this conformal block as a function of this uh, complex variable, then there are, there are poles and there are singularities. And if you manage to identify all the, all the singularities, then you can hope to write uh, the function in terms of the, of the singularities, the poles. Uh, these are classified, so in a, uh, this, this program can be, can be done. And, and you end up with a recursion relation that you, you, you might be able to, um, to use to compute the conformal block order by order. In fact, it can be done. Um, on the other hand, uh, going beyond this, uh, this result for in high dimension, uh, C 
seemed to be very complicated until in, 2000, in 2001 and then 2004, the second paper, Dolan and, uh, and Osborne managed to, uh, to solve, to, well, they, they found, but well, it was already known, a differential equation that this conformal block had to satisfy, which is uh, basically a Casimir equation. This, uh, this conformal block are eigenfunctions of the Casimir operator. And what they did, well, first in the first paper, they managed to solve, to really compute the conformal block by brute force by resumming this function sequido. And then in the second paper, they, they show that you can solve this differential equation once you put it in a suitable variable, which are the Z and Z bar variables that we um, introduced yesterday, the, those defined by uh, U equals Z, Z bar and B equals one minus Z, one minus Z bar. And once you do that, um, you can show that um, conformal blocks in even dimension uh, have a very simple form. So simple that I can write them in, a, in one line. So the conformal block, for instance, in two dimension, these are conformal blocks, not Vira's or conformal blocks, okay? These are the, the, these are the blocks that resum the contribution of an irreducible representation of the global conformal group in two dimension. They have a very simple form and they depend, of course, on the, the dimension of the operator. As I said, the irreducible representation is labeled by a single integer, positive integer L, which is the, the, the spin L representation exchange. And if you write them as a function of Z and Z bar instead of U and Z, they look particularly simple. They can be expressed in terms of a single function that we'll define in a second, K, okay, sorry, uh, which has a, a label, uh, which in one case is delta plus L, and then this is a function of Z. And in another case is delta minus L, and then is a function of Z bar, plus the, the, the same with Z and Z bar exchange. And this function k with label beta as a function of x is simply x to the beta half and then hypergeometric function 2f1 beta half beta half beta these are the parameters and then the variable is x so very simple function um and this was kind of a breakthrough because now, uh, once you have the conformal blocks, you can start playing with them. You can start uh, understanding what's the geometry of these uh, of the conformal blocks, what are the properties. And uh, although many properties can be inferred by the definition alone, having um, an explicit form uh, definitely helps. And uh, similar expression can be obtained in four dimensions, okay? There is a, an ex, uh, you can write a conformal block in four dimension that looks very similar. I'm not going to write it, but if you're interested, I can write it. And it's, it's also very, very compact expression. And you can do uh, in any even dimension, you can find an increasingly complicated expression, but nevertheless, it can be expressed in terms of a few uh, atomic uh, functions. Unfortunately, odd dimension uh, have eluded so far a simple solution like the one that I just wrote um, in terms of a, a simple function that can be written uh, in just one line. So if someone, um, if someone is, uh, is willing to tackle this problem, this is still an open problem. Okay? Finding, uh, to find um, compact and simple expression for the conformal block you know, in terms of known functions. On the other hand, there, there have been alternative methods that have been developed. Uh, most notably, uh, there is a recursion relation very similar to the one of the homologic of that I mentioned, uh, that was uh, found by Kos, Poland, and Simons Duffin in uh, 2014. And it's, um, it's very similar. In this case, it exploits uh, the property, the analyticity property of the conformal block meant as a function of the complex variable delta. So you, you look at what are the singularities in the delta plane of these conformal blocks, and then 
uh, you express the conformal block as um, a function given by some of its residues of, of the residues at the point. Um, and this allows to write an expression uh, which was known to, to exist already uh, by a previous paper, uh, but um, this method allows to compute it very efficiently, which is a so, sort of radial uh, representation of the conformal block. So if you think of, of the conformal block um, for scalars again, not in ZZ bar coordinates, but in this R and theta uh, variable um, that we introduced yesterday, okay, it was this other conformal uh, frame that I introduced. And instead of theta, I will actually use the cosine of theta, which is usually uh, called theta. You can write uh, as a, um, um, a prefactor, which is four to the, normally it's taken to be four to the r to the delta. And then there is an infinite sum uh, in the variable r that goes from zero to infinity, r to the n. Uh, there is a Gegenbauer polynomial, the uh, uh, sorry, the L um, T minus D over two uh, minus one. Um, sorry, there is a well. Let's not enter in this in these details, otherwise. I have to explain too many things, but there is a, nevertheless, there is a, the, the important point is that there is a power r to the n, and then there is a, a function that multiplies each term, which is a function of L, delta, and uh, eta. Okay, let's, let's put it in this way. And the important thing is that this function is a rational function. Of delta. And this is important for numerical application. So concretely, this, this expression is given by a recursion relation. So concretely, you Alexander, can- Alessandro, probably you object. would like to write omega n. Omega n, yeah, you're right, thank you very much. Right, thank you as well. Um, so concretely, what do we do? Concretely, we can, uh, we can consider, we can truncate the series to a certain order, uh, big N, Okay, uh, keeping only the first two terms, but this can be this approximation can be made as precise as you want by uh, going to higher and higher order. And if you do this, okay, you are able to compute the values of the conformal block at specific points and their derivative very efficiently. And if, if some of you is willing to uh, attend the numerical bootcamp uh, in this week, you will see that being able to compute derivatives with respect to R and, and eta of this conformal block evaluated at some uh, specific point, um, it's, it's a very convenient thing to do. It's a, a basic ingredient of the numerical approach that I'm going to describe next. And so this, this, uh, this expression provides you uh, exactly this, and it gives you a very specific and, and peculiar form. So this, this quantity can be computed uh, once you truncate the series to a given n, okay? So let me not put equal, but put something like this. There will be a prefactor, the power delta, and then there will be a rational function of delta, which depends, of course, of the order of truncation, capital N. It depends on the derivative that you took. And it's a function of delta, it's a function, of course, of also L. And, uh, but it's a rational function. So it's a polynomial divided by another polynomial, QN, which is uni universal. Um, plus, of course, there are corrections, order to uh, R star, to the n minus uh, n. But you see, you can make this very precise. And the important point of this uh, expression is that the denominator is positive whenever delta 
that is larger than certain value that we will discuss. Okay, uh, so for unitary theories, as we see, um, there is a, um, there are certain conditions on, on deltas, and if the conditions are obeyed, this denominator is positive in unitary theory. So keep in mind these comments because they will be useful later. Okay, so concretely, the conformal blocks in odd dimension, for instance, in three dimension, which is one of the case of interest, uh, are, are not known in a explicit and, and closed form, uh, not like the one in two dimension or four dimension, but they, they can be computed to arbitrary precision uh, very efficiently. And in particular, you can compute the, the conformal blocks and their derivative at the given point and express them as rational function of the variable delta and, uh, and L. Okay. Um, all right. So now we are almost there. Because we so, so excuse um, me, excuse me. So yes. apart from the lack of positivity, everything is also true for non-unitary theories of what you have just mentioned. Right. So far, I haven't talked about uh, unitarity except this small comment. So everything goes through. Okay. Uh, the conformal block expansion is a um, is a property of, of well. You just have to uh, assume the existence of convergent of e. Um, all right. Uh, at this point, I have five more minutes, I guess. So I can per perhaps introduce the last ingredient that we know, uh, that we need in order to proceed. Uh, because when, we, uh, when, I when I discuss four point function, I made a, a specific choice of taking the OP in a very, in one, in one possible way. So let's go back to four point function. Um, as, I say, as I said before, we can take the OPE in, in the pair phi of x1, phi of x2, phi of x3, phi of x4. And this gave, uh, this gave the conformal block function that we just um, discussed. But I could have taken the, the OPE in a different way. Okay. And of course, uh, you have to be careful that. Uh, this, this will be also converted. Um, but in the region where both OP converge, so in the region where you can draw spheres around X1 and X2 separating to X3 and X4, or you can draw a sphere surrounding X1 and X4 and, and living outside X2 and X3, uh, there's a common region where you can do both things. Then the, the OP expansion that you get uh, should give the, uh, the same expression, should give the same result. Nevertheless, uh, these two expansions do not look the same at first sight. So if I try, if I try to use this uh, compact, if I try to write compactly what I get, on one side, I get something like uh, a prefactor, which was x12 to the power two delta phi, x34 to the power two delta phi, and then we had the conformal block expansion, sum over operator, okay, in the OPE, phi with phi, uh, lambda, phi, phi, okay, square, conformal blocks, g delta k, l k, we know that the representation of okay can only be a spin l, evaluated in u and g. On the other case, on the other side, uh, on the other side of the equation, so taking the other OPE, uh, what do I do? Basically, I just I just have to exchange the role of x2 and x4. Okay, uh, as you see, uh, this is the only thing that I'm doing. And if you exchange x2 with x4, of course the prefactor will change, so there will be an x1. Four to the power two delta phi, and x uh, two three to the power two delta phi. Uh, there is still the same sum because the OPE are the same. So there is still the same OP coefficient phi phi okay square. 
But now the conformal block uh, is not evaluated in U and V, but is evaluated in the exchange variable, which are V and U. Because if you remember the, the definition, um, exchanging X2 with X4 corresponds to exchange uh, U with V. So if you now allow me to uh, rename things and reshuffling. I can rewrite the above, the above uh, constraint in the following way. First of all, I get rid of um, the prefactor by multiplying by the same uh, by the same quantity. And this allows me to reconstruct U and V again. And then the sum over operators, I just write a sum over the quantum number that represent the operator, so delta and L. I remove the label K. Okay. The first was G delta L of UV, but there was a prefactor that now becomes U to the minus uh, delta phi by multiplying, um, multiplying by the appropriate uh, factor. The second one was minus, I bring it on, on, on the left-hand side, G delta L of VU. And this time the prefactor, as you can imagine, is just exchanged, uh, is obtained by exchanging U with V. So it's V to the minus delta phi. And everything has to be equal to Z. So this uh, quantity here is called uh, crossing equation. And before some, somebody asks, uh, this is the only crossing equation that you get in the case of correlation function of four scalars, four identical scalars. Generically, there is more than one. But in this case, uh, those additional crossing equations would be equivalent to this one. Um, or they would be trivial. I'm sorry, what about the lambda, yeah. lambda square? Oh, you're right, sorry. Of course, there is, of course, a lambda square. Thank you. This is very important. Lambda uh, delta L, I, I will label that lambda delta L square. So these are the crossing equation. And the important point to remember is that this equation uh, is not satisfied term by term. And you can check this using the explicit formula that I gave you before in two dimensions. Okay, uh, You can check that this, uh, each term of this in this sum is non-zero. Okay, the anti-symmetry, the, anti the symmetrization properties of U and V, uh, and, uh, and the exchange of U and V of the conformal block are not such that this, ter this uh, term in parentheses is zero. So it must really be a conspiracy of terms that uh, make uh, that makes this uh, this expression uh, valid. Okay. And of course, similar logic goes for uh, other correlation functions of uh, any four operators. So, um, okay, I think this is a good time to stop and we will continue after the discussion session or question time um, with application of this, um, of this crossing equation. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so questions? Can I ask something about radial quantization? Sure. It's Antonio. Hi. So into D, hi. Uh, into D, when we go from the plane to the cylinder, we, put, we pay a price because the cylinder has a radius. So there's a Casimir energy. So there's a shift in the Hamiltonian by C over 12, basically. Yes. Why, why is there no such shift in a higher dimension? Or? Well, um... First of all, I, I never went to the cylinder. Okay, I, I just used the cylinder as a in the back of my mind to uh, use to to get inspired. Okay, so in the, in the formula that I wrote, uh, I never used 
concretely the cylinder uh, picture, okay, the cylinder approach. Um, then, of course, you, you do have a uh, Casimir energy if you go uh, to, a, to a compact uh, um, compact manifold, even in higher dimensions. Uh, depending on which dimension you might have a pile anomaly, so you have to pay a price also in that case. So um, depends. But but in, in these formulas, I never use the cylinder. Okay. Uh, I, were, were you referring to, to some of these uh, of the things we discussed or just in general? No, just in general, yeah, it's okay. Ah, okay. Uh, well, then I imagine there is a there is also a Casimir energy also on the, in, on the cylinder in, in a high dimension. So you, okay. you you do get you do get, for instance, um, uh, non-zero expectation values of, of um, I would say, of the stress. Wouldn't this Casimir energy somehow cancel out from most correlation functions? So for example, from this four-point correlation function of scalars, you can yeah, pull it, it, it on will, the cylinder, you can pull it on flat space, and it's, in it's the, not yeah. affected by Casimir energy. Right. Not on yeah, not all correlation functions are affected by it. You can observe it. I, I believe, no? well, let's say like almost all are not affected. There's got some very special stress tensor. Right. Yeah, you have to look for it, but yeah, it's not only, only only when the stress tensor is involved. No, only when the stress tensor is involved. Yeah. Aren't these things all fixed by the vial anomaly? Pretty much, I think. Pretty much, yeah. Right. So it depends on dimensions and depends on correlation function. Thank you. Short question. Yes. I have a question. Sorry, uh, Jacopo. Vito. Yeah. What is the uh, uh, what are the analytic uh, properties of these blocks with the dimension that they are analytic in D? You can right. So there is a there is a a, a behavior at infinity, which is given basically by this prefactor r to the delta that you can strip out. Okay. So this, this function will be you can dimension of the space time. I mean, oh, the dimension of space time. Sorry. <laughs> um, now this is I don't I don't think it's known. What the so there is a dependence um, in D. Uh, if I I don't think. Um, so in the in the recursion relation that defines the conformal block, okay, D appears as a parameter, and then once you uh, once you start resolving the, the, the recursion relation, this D uh, appears uh, as uh, the dependence on D is just a rational function for each term in the um, uh, in this radial expansion that I wrote. But then once you resum the the whole series, I, I don't know what what are the properties. I don't think it's known. Okay, thank you. Maybe, maybe there is some somebody that works on this. Uh, uh, I have a comment regarding this. I think Abhijit Gadde has a paper where he explored this thing that at large dimension, how the conformal blocks looks like in asymptotically large D value. Uh, uh, yeah, in, in the asymptotic limit, there, there has been work, yes. Uh, but generically, it's not known. But there is no reason to expect that there is some non liticity. Most likely, yeah. it is analytic as a function of D. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, it's very speculative. I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't know how to answer this question. No, but okay. it's, it's given by a convergent power series expansion. Every term in this power series expansion is an analytic function of D. Right. So unless the series stops converging, uh, some of analytic functions is an analytic function. But I mean, there are poles in D, right? Yeah. Because, uh, for fixed delta, when you there are poles. yeah, it's a rational function, so there are poles. Yeah. No, there are poles at D at some special values of delta, but if you steer clear of those poles, well, but for any fixed delta, right? You fix delta now, you vary D continuously. If you vary it continuously, I mean. Well, let's fix delta to ten. Yes. And let's vary D say between one and two. So 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 when I don't w... think there's going to be any poles. 
when delta is equal to d minus two over two and l equals zero, for instance. Yeah, right? but I said set six delta to ten and let's vary d between one and two. Ah, well, <laughs> okay. I mean, then I think there are some. There's a lot of uh, probably there's some neuromorphicity. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, for sure. Some I have a short. I have a short question about uh, F21. Yes. So D, for D equals two, we have F21. So yes. D equals four, six. Do you have also hyperbolic uh, functions or just uh, solution of linear equations? So uh, for D equals four, it's still, um, it's still given by F21. Uh, sorry, to F1. Uh, except that now you have to take an anti-symmetrization anti of two functions. Uh, and then for, for higher dimension, sincerely, I don't remember the exact expression for d equals six, uh, but it's, it's still a combination of hypergeometric functions. Now, I don't remember if it's higher hypergeometric function or still 2f1. Um, I, I think it's it, always 2f1s multiplied by some rational functions of z and z1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because basically there's a recursion relation that allows you to express it's conformal blocks in d dimension as conformal blocks in d minus two dimension multiplied by three factors. So, I, yeah, as, as Miguel was saying, it's just uh, same same uh, same function, same two f one, but you have more. You have more terms. Uh, hello, I have one question uh, regarding this convergence of OP expansion. So. Like in usual quantum field theory, possibly this OP expansion don't converge, right? It doesn't uh, yeah. And uh, and like uh, so, like in CFT, then like uh, what constraint or what tells us that this OP expansion have to be convergent? Well, intuitively, it's because you have scaling bias. So scaling bias. So you can you can imagine that doesn't matter which. Uh, at which distance two points are, ex uh, as long as there is not nothing in the in the between. So it's something like topological, if you want. You, you just have it's the order of the operators that matters, not the distance. So th this is the intuitive picture. Then, uh, uh, I mean, you can reformulate this with fat integrals. You can shrink spheres, and uh, everything goes to goes to smooth thing. In the quantum field theory, you don't have this possibility. Okay, okay, thank you. Then there's, there's, yeah, there's lava here, which is an extra, so. And yeah, but intuitively this is the risk. More questions? Yeah, I have a question. So uh, at some point you were discussing OPEs uh, or yeah. fusion. And uh, you said that if there's an extra symmetry present, for example, having to do with rotations, or things like that, that you would basically fix it by looking just at, at tensor products. But now, uh, most theories that we are interested in or motivated from, they, they come from some discrete models. So mm -hmm. they could be the easing model or ON models or, or something more complicated. And so to realize anything but the simplest symmetries, you would have to define a microscopic operator that would act on uh, locally, but on more than one degree of freedom, more than one spin, right? So wouldn't you have to take into account as uh, symmetry, both that symmetry under the transformation of the, the group that you discussed, and also some permutation symmetry with respect to the local lattice points that you're acting on to get something that is completely irreducible. Uh, right, so in, in the continuum limit of, of the lattice, uh, you, will, you will get a, a quantum field, a conformal field theory, okay? That is, um, I mean, the Hilbert space uh, implements, is, is divided in representation of both the conformal symmetry and eventually, a global symmetry that commutes with the with the conformal symmetry. So, um, one, once you take the continuum limit, uh, this um, the mixing of 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 the of the degrees of, of the microscopic degrees of freedom. It's it's instantly factorizes. Okay, you can 
uh, you either have, I mean, you have rotation, translation, conformal symmetry, and then on top of this, you can have additional symmetries that rotate among them, uh, among each other, different irreducible representation, but they are, they commute. So that these are not uh, these are not space-time symmetries. So they, they just commute among each other. I'm not sure if that's what I, what you had in mind. I'm um, I'm raising the question because I studied a bit the Q-state pot model, right? Uh, in which you can realize various kinds of SQ symmetries by yeah. acting on on a on a certain number of spins, right? And it turns out in the, in that model that you would have uh, to to genuinely generate something irreducible, you would have to analyze the interplay between the SQ symmetry and the SN symmetry if you're acting on N spins. So you will actually have to deal with both of them. Uh, I agree, but then in the continuum, okay, but once you take the continuum limit, uh, you will have, uh, I mean, this will determine which representation you have in, uh, in the continuum limit. So in particular, there will be multiples uh, of this uh, permutation symmetry uh, that are, uh, when you, once you make a transformation, they are rotated among each other. Um, but the, the, I mean, if you start from a primary, you will end up with a primary. If you start with a descendant, you end up with a descendant. They are not mixed. They, they reduce the conformal properties are not mixed once you make a, a, a transformation. Now, how you pass, how you take the continuum limit, that's another story. It's, it's very complicated. And I'm sure you are more expert than I am. Um, but but the, the final point, the, the point that you will reach will be a, 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 pro, a, a Hilbert space, or if you want, a set of operators that are labeled by various quantum numbers, the quantum numbers of the conformal symmetry and the, the quantum numbers of the permutation symmetry. And that's it. Um, how these are implemented at the microscopic level uh, this uh, depends on the model, of course, and uh, it, it might be a tough question. But actually, yeah, uh, uh, Jasper, but what I worried about that, that, you know, that you have some on the lattice, you have some complicated object, which is made out of many spins and you arrange them at carefully so that it transforms irreducibly. And here in CFT, we just denoted by one letter phi of X. Is this what worries you? I guess I just wanted to point out that making this precise link via the lattice discretization might be quite complicated. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> just saying that you have to do a tensor product looks a little bit deceivingly simple if, if, if what you want is what I suggested. No, but are you worried about tensor product of... So there are two issues here, it seems to me that, okay, first you have to construct a single local operator which transforms irreducibly. And you are saying on the lattice to get it, you have you may have to look very carefully, arrange your lattice variables very carefully so that it transforms reducibly. It actually happens in any theory. You can do you have to do it in lattice QCD or in pots and whatever. You have to be careful if you want to get an operator which transforms appropriately. Uh, but then once you got this local operator phi of x. Uh, then if you now take two of these operators and put them at a certain distance from each other, then assuming that you did a careful job arranging one of them and did the careful job arranging the other of them, uh, you don't have to do any extra job to analyze their product. And, and, and uh, I think Alessandro assumed that somebody did a careful job getting yeah, one operator I, and then and then he starts from here well but then i guess if you start fusing them then you will again you will again have to analyze carefully this microscopic structure if you have chosen no, so, no. no? you don't what do you mean by that? fusing because fusing means you don't want to bring them uh, so close to each other that, okay, on the lattice, this operator has some radius, you know, because for example, you use 10 lattice spins to construct it. So it has like, maybe on the lattice, it has radius three or something like that. But we fuse it in the continuum theory. So you don't want to, to bring this you operator don't, don't closer to than them. their actual radius on the lattice when you fuse them. 
And so they never actually, their, their inner structure on the lattice never enters into this uh, consideration. Of course, if you bring them, if you put them on top of each other, then there's going to be a mess, but you don't, you shouldn't do it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. But maybe it's a bit complicated to discuss this without writing explicit formulas. So. All right. Okay. Well, I suggest that uh, we adjourn and we can ask more questions maybe at the end of the second uh, lecture. Okay. okay. So we meet in uh, at uh, eleven. So in fifteen minutes. All right.